so good evening everybody uh, uh, it's our pleasure to uh, sit today with the, as, as a part of a master uh, interventional uh, course under the umbrella of Gulf Intervention Society uh, our webinar today is for uh, structural heart disease uh, topic is uh, challenges in TAVI uh, uh, again so we're always to try to uh, our best uh, to bring the most expert people in the field uh, to talk to you about uh, uh, our subject. Uh, we really appreciate your presence. Uh, uh, thank you very much for Medtronic for supporting uh, this event tonight. Um, and uh, thank you very much for ICOM for organizing this. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce our program and, and speaker and panelist. We have Dr. Anthony Lavon, Interventional uh, Cardiology, uh, Paris, France. He's uh, having a great collaboration with the GIS in uh, multiple uh, topics mainly uh, structural heart disease. We have Dr. Kreiser, uh, a member of interventional cardiology, a member of Texas uh, Heart Institute, United States. We have our panelist from uh, uh, Gulf area, Dr. Fahad Basleib, CEO of uh, uh, Rashid Cardiac Center, uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, we have Dr. Hussain Al Amri, senior interventional cardiology from Prince uh, Sultan Cardiac Center. Dr. Wael uh, Qashqari, uh, senior interventional cardiologist from uh, King Faisal uh, Cardiac Center National Guard uh, Hospital in uh, Jeddah. Also, we have Dr. Saleh Hashlash, who will present a great case, have a lot of points of learning, and, and I'm sure it will create a lot of, of uh, uh, discussion and question from audience and panelists. Uh, Dr. Saleh Hashlash is an interventional cardiology director of the cath lab in King Fahad uh, Medical City. So uh, we'll go over the, our two uh, presentation. First one will be done by Dr. Anthony Lavon about the challenges uh, in TAVI. He has kindly uh, collected all uh, uh, the topic in one presentation and we uh, uh, push him to make it as short as we can, although uh, this topic is a huge to be covered. So I will not uh, uh, take more time from his presentation. So Dr. Lavon, please start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your nice introduction. Uh, it's I since I share my screen, I I like to share my screen. Um, do you see something? Yes, doctor, we show, we see your screen. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so thank you very much uh, from uh, the organizer for uh, this uh, great uh, topic and uh, also for this challenging lecture because uh, TAVI challenge, it will be uh, very, uh, very uh, dense. Uh, so this is my title in challenge before, challenge during and challenge after TAVI. Uh, I will uh, share with my colleague, uh, Dr. Kreischer, the, all the electrophysiology uh, challenge that he will uh, certainly uh, greatly uh, present. So before TAVI, before TAVI, uh, the most important is to prevent mortality during and after TAVI, to decrease the stroke, to decrease the major vascular complications, which are in fact killing our patient during the intervention, as well as cardiac perforation, which are more rare and also to avoid the permanent pacemaker implant and atrial fibrillation. So the first challenge is to evaluate the candidate and frailty and survival in TAVI, this uh, very interesting study from Kiani. You can see on the screen that in fact, uh, uh, if you have uh, three uh, parameters of slow speed, you will uh, multiply the cumulative incidence of death in this population. Uh, very interesting study on paper, patient uh, older than 90. And you can see that in fact, uh, you double the in-hospital mortality and you double the 30 days uh, follow-up mortality. So uh, this has to be in mind because uh, does it, uh, is it worth to, to do it? And uh, so you have to collaborate with geriatrician people and also uh, anesthesiologists. So uh, what is a strategy in care of multivascular disease, valvular disease? I have not time to develop it. I would say that severity stenosis with uh, important um, mitral regurgitation, you should uh, try the TAVR as long as there is a contraindication as a surgical candidate. And then in my experience, 
experience, uh, most of the mitral vegetation will uh, regress or even the if in case uh, it is uh, still symptomatic, severe MR, uh, then you have to think about percutaneous uh, uh, intervention. And then let's go to the association of aortic stenosis with uh, mitral stenosis. If really it can be done, do surgery on both valves. If it cannot, then do TAVR first. And then if it is possible, think about mitral balloon valvulotomy. And then last but not least, severe stenosis with TR, tracuspid regurgitation. Uh, it is again the same. As long as you have a contraindication for, a long, uh, for a surgery, just go to TAVR. And then if you worsen the tracuspid regurgitation with symptoms, and then you have to think about uh, transcatheter uh, tracuspid uh, intervention. In it is very interesting to see that you little the TR and you improve greatly, exponentially, the uh, symptoms. So this uh, paper from CAND is really very interesting. So these are the ACC recommendations regarding the centers. I would say check your center. Either you are on the green, reasonable ongoing case volume with optimal outcomes, carry on. If you're on a low volume and optimal uh, outcome, the message is be careful that you may just overestimate because you have too low volume to really be sure that you are optimal. But then in the case orange, you are in the low volume and less than optimal outcome. Urgency to either increase the volume and the optimal outcome or to, to do another, uh, to, to stop in TAVI. And then the red is very interesting. The red is a reasonable volume and less than optimal outcomes. Diagnosis, do the treatment that is to improve step by step in order to improve the optimal outcome, to increase. So this work from Vemulapali is very interesting in the New England Journal of Medicine 2019. In fact, it shows you, in fact, that if you are between 150 and 200, you don't need to do 2,000 TAVR per year to be uh, in a very good group. The mortality at 30 days is really uh, as low as possible, which is a very interesting uh, data. So which way to go is another challenge that you have very carefully to evaluate. So you have the femoral artery, you have the transapical and the transartic with, with which, uh, to uh, going to decrease. And then you have the supra aortic that is This is uh, something we'll do in our So femoral access, obvious gold standard. Clinical examination, don't forget to ask about claudication because even if scanner tells you good arteries, but in fact, you will have some problems, especially in old patients. Be very careful to add uh, Echo Doppler study uh, because uh, the CT scan may totally overestimate the quality of the reality of the arteries. And then I, I mentioned the Willis cycle because if you want to do carotid arteries, you should uh, be careful that your Willis uh, uh, is uh, working correctly. Uh, so the CT scan is wonderful. It will tell you the calcification it will tell you uh, whether the aortic arch is not gothic or not. If gothic, I would recommend to go with the supra uh, aortic that is the carotid superior in order to uh, avoid the And then the calcification and tortuosity are also very important to check. The proper annulus sizing. This is absolutely mandatory. This is not echo which can do this. This is the algorithm of your that you will check with your radiologist and yourself in order to perform clear, clear evaluation of the annulus of the distance between the ostia and the annulus and also uh, the size of the valsalva uh, in order to see whether there is space or not. But again, the proper annulus sizing, if you overestimate or underestimate, it cannot work. David transfemoral. Be very careful with calcified tortuous diameter less than six millimeter and go slice by slice with the CT. It is the best way to, 
see whether, as you can see here, you have one or two uh, very kinds of specification. So on the very right, you have the Willis polygon with, with MRI that easily to check whether there is a good uh, collateralization uh, if uh, you in there with the carotid and you have to close even for a short time the carotid. So the, the carotid for us is really something we like because it is a very short way to go from the uh, the carotid uh, to, to the, the art. And then the way in the aorta is very small. So the complications are really decreasing as I will show you later. So the advantage of carotid subclavian uh, access is you can perform local anesthesia, you have fast access and implantation, very important deployment precision, bike speed, aortic regurgitation, uh, and uh, You hear me? Hello? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, uh, deployment uh, precision, bike speed, arctic regurgitation, and large annulus. It is very important. And also, when the aorta is, uh, the annulus is uh, vertical and the aorta is horizontal. And recapture is very easy in contrast with the uh, femoral. So, this is a, a study that we perform in. Uh, in in a, with the Tavi, uh, France Tavi registry and published in the JAC last year. In fact, uh, 28,000 uh, uh, cases Tavi, and we compare with the propensity score matching two population. The first uh, one, which is femoral Tavi, 1,613 patients compared with non femoral, that is carotid or subclavian. We excluded the, the, the central. Uh, and uh, then we subdivided in two period 13 to 15 and to 17 because of the huge progress in the technology uh, which can which can considering that uh, the data that we have before may be uh, not uh, uh, may be worn out so what we see first is that the femoral is increasing from uh, 13 to 17 and then second is that the the central that is the transartic and transapical are really decreasing and the uh, supra uh, aortic are uh, maintained because there is a reason. And uh, you may have some uh, dis uh, reluctance, but uh, when you look at this data, I will summarize because I have no time. There was no difference with annulus rupture, dissection, valve migration, tamponade, uh, uh, stroke, but for vascular approach complication, you have a significantly more femoral uh, complication uh, instead of um, the cut or the challenge is to decide with your group, your anesthesiologist, to go to conscious sedation instead of general anesthesia. Conscious sedation decrease in hospital mortality, decrease 30 day mortality, and decrease in hospital stay. Uh, with all patients, it is very difficult to have them to walk again, and then they, they will lose their muscle and it will. They, they must be, as uh, Molière said, they, they die uh, in, in great shape. Uh, the valve choice. Uh, for small uh, aortic valve area, it is very important to have this uh, different way to measure instead of, uh, in order not to have a bad surprise with a uh, discrepancy in the valve size. And I recommend this paper from Rodes Cabo in circulation. Do you, do you hear me? I carry on. Yes, uh, in small uh, valve, uh, this study from Regazzoli uh, is studying uh, the, uh, the quality of uh, between self-expanding valve, and you can see easily that the Evolute Pro is really the best valve for small uh, annulus, for small uh, aortic annulus. So very quickly, everybody know the Sapien, everybody know the core valve, I have no time for showing the other. The valvin valve, mitral bioprosthesis is clearly Edward Sapien's uh, choice, but for aortic bioprosthesis, as I showed you, it is uh, clearly a co core valve. Uh, for the valve anatomy, aortic regurgitation and bicuspid valve, uh, we choose uh, preferentially the core valve because of supranulus and because it works better. 
So let's go now to the challenge during Tavi. Very first, you have to go through the annulus, and sometimes it is very stiff, very uh, uh, difficult, but uh, you will succeed. You will succeed. My, what I do is very simple. I use on plus AL1 or AL2. I use a straight wire. Sorry, it is in French. And I use an or LAO uh, orientation. And in 99% of the case, it works. So I'd like to give some credit to my friend and, uh, Thomas Modin from Lille, who was the first uh, surgeon to propose the carotid approach and to make it simplify. Uh, we are working as a team. And I show you a brief uh, video to show that, in fact, we are working like, as a team. And this team is composed of a surgeon, Dr. Rashid Zegdi, anesthesiologist, Dr. Thierry Carrier here, uh, radiologist, and uh, the, the paramed is very important. And then the access is very easy. And uh, usually surgeons who have the, uh, this access and uh, it doesn't really take time. The very important point is that you will palp the, the carotid artery and uh, you will have the opportunity to um, um, be able to make the puncture in a place which is not uh, uh, calcified or uh, thick. Uh, I don't know if you hear the sound. But it's, uh, your sound is more clear, so you can go ahead. I, okay. If I cut the sound, do you hear me? We can hear you very well, even with the background of the sound. Yes. So, in fact, uh, the access is uh, very, very fast, very simple. Then you have only uh, with X-ray to verify that you are uh, going in the ascent outer and very straight. Uh, we just uh, use uh, the wire, the, the straight wire to uh, cross the aortic annulus and, uh, and then uh, we just uh, put the valve and I could set up uh, the, the video here. And so you see the team here. Very important, uh, just, uh, yes, you see, this is something that we don't use anymore. This is uh, the sheath for the valve because it is uh, time consuming, it is dangerous, it, is, uh, it doesn't help, it is totally useless. And usually the carotid are very, uh, they are elastic vessel in contrast to the femoral iliac artery. And uh, very uh, easy to go and a very important point radiologist tells you oh the artery carotid artery is very tortuous don't believe him because the, art, the carotid artery is free so you just hold it very gently and the carotid artery becomes straight so this is a radiologist uh, uh, remark that you should not uh, take uh, seriously so then we put the valve and uh, 10 centimeters later, we are in the Arctic uh, level. Here is a valve and this is over. Very important, before closing the artery, uh, we make a check with the near system with the electroradiologist so that uh, we verify that the, the brain is not suffering. And usually we have a 10 minutes closure. So. Very important, next point, better valve positioning. Selection of delivery is critical. You should find it, as you see on the left, uh, a line. And usually I start with a zero uh, uh, angulation and it works. Uh, you do a little more uh, cocodal, LAO, RAO, and you, you find it. Otherwise you can find it with the algorithm of your CT scan. So I go fast because uh, so Sapien, you need to be 50-50 regarding the, 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 the annulus and then for the core valve, four to six millimeter depth. And I show you, if you don't mind, um, the advantage of uh, this uh, valve that you can reposition is, uh, in fact, uh, here it is well positioned, as you see. But let's go now to the next. Uh, you can see that the valve is still well positioned. 
and uh, the, the, the opposite part of the valve uh, will be well positioned. But here, uh, the valve is well, uh, the valve will pop up. So what do we do? We just retrieve the valve and reposition it. And uh, we, we can uh, have a, a clear uh, and a nice deployment of the valve with a minimal arctic regurgitation. Let's go now to the chimney technique to avoid coronary occlusion. This is something that we perform when the level uh, ostia distance between the ostia and the annulus is less than 10 millimeter. Then there is a risk of coronary uh, obstruction uh, when you deploy the valve. And uh, you, I recommend using a self-expanding valve. And before doing that, you first uh, position your catheter, sorry, and uh, you put a stent in the left main trunk, a big stent, uh, downstream to the uh, LED. And then you start uh, to do uh, simultaneous kissing, and, that, and this is it. And you have uh, salvaged your uh, uh, coronary artery. Next point, very important, uh, the aortic regurgitation. This uh, slide from Popma showed that, in fact, you cannot leave a patient outside the uh, cat lab if there is a bigger than moderate uh, aortic regurgitation. And uh, so another, uh, this was a case of a, a relatively young patient, uh, and uh, we pre-deployed the, the, uh, the valve because uh, we needed to have a very safe uh, deployment. That is, the uh, core valve did not have access, uh, did uh, uh, have uh, the, um, the star uh, mitral valve. And as you can see here, uh, all despite the valve is well positioned, uh, the valve is not um, satisfactory. There is an arctic regurgitation. So we do a rapid pacing, very important, and we over deploy the valve. And then we will avoid to have a big arctic regurgitation. And on the control, we can see that the two valves are well. There is no connection between the two valves and there is no uh, aortic regurgitation. So how to quantify PVL volume? I'll go very fast. Angiography, I don't believe, except when it is very strong. Echo, I would not recommend. We do not use TE because TE means a general anesthesia. And uh, TTE is not uh, good enough. Hemodynamic only works to evaluate simply the functional consequence of PVL. Equalization of end diastolic aortic and left ventricular pressure is a decisive for indicative further intervention. And I recommend this study uh, from Sinning, extremely important, is uh, in fact they make an air, uh, uh, air index, which is in fact the diastolic blood pressure minus left uh, ventricular end diastolic pressure divided by systolic blood pressure. If, as you see on the right, you are bigger than 25, then the mortality will be less. But if you are less than 25, then you will have a mortality which is very high. And this is the criteria that, that we still use uh, when, uh, in, in order to be sure that uh, we, for the patient, we will not leave uh, arctic regurgitation, which is too important. So, with paravalvular arctic regurgitation, in terms of misdeployment, as you've seen, post dilation, misplacement, valve in valve, repositioning, and in case of failure of the, the percutaneous approach, if it is a self expanding valve, you can still wait for one or two days because the self expansion may improve, uh, decrease the arctic regurgitation, if not surgery. Balloon post dilation, be very careful of the benefit risk ratio because you can have annular rupture, you can have pop-up of the valve, and so it should be avoided if asymmetric bulky calcification of porcelain aorta. Use the same balloon diameter plus one milliliter more uh, in case of a, a sapient valve, 
and rapid pacing during balloon inflation is mandatory. So I show you just some devices that has been shown by Al Kuli in the very interesting um, presentation. It's, I recommend to embolize THV during TFVR, but for the sake of time, let's go to the stroke. Stroke is something we should never see in our patient, but unfortunately, it is still present. Uh, Sigur uh, showed uh, this very interesting uh, study uh, with, uh, in fact, uh, prevention of stroke with a dual filter. And interestingly, it decreased by 65% uh, relative reduction. So this is something to think about. We do better than surgeon uh, in terms of stroke, but it is not, not anymore the gold standard. We are becoming the gold standard, and uh, we should consider that we should even improve this uh, stroke, especially for the future and low and low risk and uh, and, and um, patient uh, young patient population. Tavi in because die, but don't be afraid. I would recommend to go with no over uh, don't over. Uh, exaggerate the size, you should be right at the size and, and, and no more of, of the annulus that you have collected. And you should be uh, right at the level, very close to the, to the, to the annulus. And uh, in this study of Forrest, which is very recent, 2020 from the Jack, you can see that the comparison between uh, match people, BQ speed and trigger speed, in terms of all call mortality, uh, there is a similarity between the two population. And in terms of stroke, we have also similarity of the two population. So valve in valve, it is still offline, but it is a great uh, challenge and also a great result. And I would recommend to use this aptly. I have no interest, uh, interest for that. But you have a lot of sure how will buy, buy prosthesis before starting. So web in the Jack, published the partner to registry with uh, Edward Valve, showing very good results in terms of the gradient, in terms of the area, and in terms of the functional follow-up. Valve in, in, in TAVI, reduce surgery. Don't do reduce surgery because it is less, much less uh, as a Valve in Valve. They decrease uh, 30 days mortality by 7.5. It decreases the new pacemaker. It decreases blood transfusion. And these are absolute decrease. They are not real, relative. So I would recommend the TAVI instead of reduced surgery. And uh, Cheche uh, published exactly similar result with the core valve uh, with, uh, as was performed with the party with Edward. Uh, just two examples of, with the core valve uh, from Cheche. So challenge after Tavi, if I can finally finish. Uh, I like this slide from France 2 predictors of one year mortality also, it is an old slide. Perivalvular arterial regurgitation is a very bad uh, predictor. Atrial fibrillation, renal failure, increase in functional status uh, are something to see. Frailty, we started with it, you will pay for it, you will have uh, Increase of death based on the three criteria, increase of bleeding, increase of less of stay. Uh, Outer regurgitation, again, on five years, you can see in the study of Gherkins in 2016, uh, that uh, there is a significantly more death with uh, a st stronger, uh, more severe outer regurgitation. But interestingly, uh, this uh, study from uh, presented by Mark, uh, I see, shows that uh, the, there is more mild and there is a much less uh, uh, severe aortic uh, regurgitation. So maybe this is because of the improvement of the technology. So very important, the stroke. In this study, you can see that uh, the stroke is 50% occur during the 24 hours, but then, almost 50% occur during the next four weeks. So we have to be very careful, very, very careful, especially with a high risk population. So thrombosis of the valve, especially valve in valve, but also it occurs with a native uh, uh, TAVI. 
it, it, it is something which is shown with an increase in the gradient. And Adel Wahab presented this nice study showing that after treatment, uh, in fact, you decrease the, the, uh, the valve uh, in valve from this. So anticoagulant uh, comparison between VKA and NOAC, and you can see that there is a clear advantage of uh, uh, VKA. Uh, and what we do in our uh, institution is we do not stop VKA as long as it is around 2 and 2.5 ENR because uh, it uh, will reduce the stroke and uh, we, we, we can uh, adjust uh, during the procedure. So I finish with for patient at low risk, younger, what is a long term? Because it is fine to have no problem during the intervention, but uh, more pacemaker, it will be told by my colleague pressure. And what, what do we do with the article regurgitation? The, this slide shows in fact that low risk is a major part of surgical uh, a patient that we are going to succeed, uh, to, to perform. And we have to be very, very careful this population because they can out regurgitation and uh, pacemaker, especially when they are less than 60 years old. So very interesting slide from TCT, which was already show that low risk population had, did a greater job uh, than uh, the surgery uh, match population. Uh, I go to the notion trial, which is the same thing at two years between surgery and TAVR. Uh, low, we, we do very good job with TAVR. Arctic regurgitation is still present. We discuss about that. Partner 3, very important, published uh, last year, showing with uh, Sapien that, in fact, at one year, it decreased uh, death, stroke, and rehospitalization by two almost between surgery and TAVR. Evolo risk, which is showing similarly the same thing at uh, one year, but is no more significant, but at, at least. Uh, it is uh, uh, equivalent to surgery. Interestingly, we can see that uh, since the ATS score is decreasing, in fact, the age of our patient is not decreasing. So be very careful with uh, this, this population, old population. Very important for us of, to our good uh, improving our, our mood. In fact, sur surgery life expectancy after surgical replacement after 60 years is not good. Uh, so we have, we, there is place for, for TAVI. Coronary access for TAVI after TAVI is another challenge, very important. In this study of OCHI, it shows that Evolut Pro did not have any unfavorable access, coronary access, well, uh, in contrast, uh, Sapien at 33% of uh, unfavorable coronary access. And then I finish with this slide. Reoperation after TAVI is a nightmare. It is worse than expected. It is 17 to high risk population, uh, not uh, and difficult uh, explantation. So we should think that we cannot go to reduce surgery on this population. I just uh, pass this slide and say that in fact, yes, we did a great job uh, in the early uh, 2018, and then the early risk, we went go to the increased risk, intermediate risk, and now we are going to the lower risk and younger patient. And I really close this lecture by saying, yes, it is great, but we have to be very careful with this because those patients will have a an expectancy of life which is much higher than all what we have seen before. I'd like to thank the industry for this fantastic collaboration uh, in terms of movement of the device uh, 12 or 15 years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lavon. It's a great presentation. Actually, I asked you about a, a huge uh, topic and you summarize it uh, very nicely in uh, uh, less than 30 minutes. So we'll go to our uh, panelists, uh, just a direct question, maybe less than two minutes for each uh, to comment. Uh, Dr. Hussain Al-Amri, just a, a comment on the presentation. Uh, plus, what do you think? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, so what do you think the most challenge uh, of TAVI in 2020? 
thank you, Dr. Lafayette, for this uh, outstanding and brilliant presentation. Uh, you made it uh, look very easy. Uh, I think TAVI itself is, is a challenge uh, as a procedure, uh, selection, patient selection, procedure itself, and the care of patients after TAVI. Uh, with uh, time and with experience, you, you learn how to deal with the complications. You learn how to choose your patient. I think the uh, forthcoming uh, uh, challenge is mainly the patient age because risk is not equivalent to age. A patient could be 80 years old and he's low risk and he could be 40 years old and he's high risk for uh, surgery. So the patient age is the main challenge for us in, in the near future. If you look at the guideline, they are still talking about the uh, intermediate and high risk patients or increased risk. So still low risk patients are a challenge. Uh, I mean, young patients because of the valve durability and because of the uh, challenges during surgery if you decide uh, to send patients for surgery. Uh, so uh, I, I'd like to ask uh, the prof, what's the youngest age they did and what do they do with patients in the 50s or in the 40s? If they request for TADI, is the patient request valid? Uh, in, in fact, we, we, have, uh, we perform uh, rarely on offline uh, people who are uh, 60 year old uh, basically, they are biker speeds, and uh, usually these are uh, uh, entrepreneurs, people who cannot dare to leave their enterprise more than 15 days, and uh, they, it is for them the most important. So we are very, very careful. We show them to the surgeon who, who tell them the, the pro and the contra, and uh, after a complete uh, uh, refuse of the patient, uh, but this is really rare because we are really in, in offline. Sorry, and, and I think one last challenge is the patient preference. It's always a challenge for us when a patient comes and insists to go for TAVI rather than for surgery. What, what do you do that, with that? This is very difficult because in fact, uh, the patient have access to internet and they discuss as uh, they were colleagues. <laughs> So it's very difficult and we try to tell them uh, what their responsibility, uh, they cannot decide uh, all by uh, internet information. And we try to, to highlight them uh, the pro and the contra, and we try to tell them that guidelines uh, recommend things and we have to be stick. But at the very end, the patient will choose. Okay, great. Thanks, Dr. Hussain. Dr. Fahad Basleib. Can you unmute yourself kindly, Fahad? Uh, thank you, Fawaz. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Lafon for this comprehensive talk uh, that he did a great job in a very short time covering the whole uh, thing about TAVI pre and during and post. Uh, actually, uh, the key about TAVI is good planning. If you plan the case very well and discuss it with your colleagues, and your heart team from your echocardiographer, from your radiologist, uh, to determine your axis, the sizing, and uh, also uh, the uh, choice of the valve you'll be using. Uh, I think it's a key factor is to do the pre-planning, uh, more important for me during the procedure. Uh, also, I would like to emphasize on keeping the procedure as uh, minimalist as you can. Uh, with being conscious sedation, no transesophageal echo, uh, and uh, early discharge from hospitals. Uh, for me, the most challenging, uh, just funny enough or paradoxically, is doing the lower risk patients. Because with lower risk patients, the expectation is very high. And you want to reduce the complication as much as you can. Especially in young patients, you don't want to give them like uh, you don't want to have any peripheral uh, access problems. You don't have to have uh, more than a moderate regard. You want to do a, a perfect job on these cases. You want to avoid uh, giving them a pacemaker. So uh, that's, that's challenging uh, and more demanding now, doing lower risk patients. Higher risk patients, I think with a good uh, planning and knowing your complications, 
and how you will manage them, I think that's, uh, that's the key for the success. Great, good. Uh, Dr. Wael, what do you think about the challenges of 2020 before we go to next presentation? Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Laban. It's an excellent uh, talk. I have just a couple of comments uh, for the BMW. Uh, whenever you go ahead and you implant, uh, plan to do a case and you start your catecholamine go high, most of the focus, it go around the axis. Whenever even you do like carotid or subclavian or, you know, like an, not a femoral, like any other, uh, any other axis, uh, you have to focus, yes, on the axis, but it's very important. You have to give good result for the patient regarding the implantation level. So you have to take in consideration the, uh, you don't want to cause a heart block, your implantation have to be high, you have to use different technique. Uh, you want to make sure that the, the best chance for the patient to access the coronary in the future, you have to go with commissure alignment. So don't panic and don't focus only on the axis. You have really to make sure that your level of implantation is very good. You, you don't want to focus on something and you cause a problem in the other side. That's one thing. The other thing is for the people who do the chimney, very important, you keep the guy catheter or the guy liner away while you are advancing your, 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 your valve. So because a lot of reported cases, you see people, they advance the catheter, advance the valve, and it is accidentally advanced with it. The guide catheter, it will end up by the distal lift main and cause dissection. Uh, the, uh, the, the, regarding the, the carotid approach, a lot of people, you know, like so excited about it. The data we have is good outcome, but none of them is powered for stroke. Is it increasing the rate of stroke? Is the number of the patient included in studies enough to tell us about the stroke in this approach? And I think it's a big concern. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the last thing I want to say is that uh, as Fahad Baslev said, planning the case is very, very important. Uh, you want to do the best for the patient. One last comment, our patient here is in, in the Gulf region, I'm talking about the Gulf region. When you are saying he's 65 year old, actually they look like 70 or 75 in Europe or North America. They are like physically not competent. They look like chronologically, they look more elder than uh, other area. So you have to take in consideration, really, when you look at your patient, 65, no, I want to do, go with surgery, let the surgeon look at her. No, actually, she looked like 70, 75. So this is a very important uh, when you make a decision and when you give the, uh, the patient uh, the, the, uh, the, the options. Diabetic, uh, no any activity, sedentary life, this is all affect the outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wal. Uh, uh, I think we'll go to our next presentation. Is Dr. Kreiser with us? Uh, doctor, I think he has a problem in connection. He has just left us now. Okay, great. So I think we're so all excited to see Dr. Saleh Shlash uh, case. Uh, it's an interesting, and uh, we, we saw it uh, uh, while we were preparing this uh, uh, webinar. I'm sure it will create a lot of uh, discussion because it's a lot of uh, teaching point. Uh, Saleh, uh, we are uh, happy to have you today. Please uh, start your presentation. Uh, thank you, you so much. To see thank you so much, Dr. Fawaz. I'd like to thank the Gulf Interventional Society for allowing me to share this case with uh, my colleagues. And I'd like to also thank Dr. Fawaz for the terrific educational program that GIS is putting out in structural cases and in, coronary artery, in the treatment of coronary artery disease. We look forward to more uh, adult congenital heart disease as well. <laughs> We're going to get greedy as we see more of these webinars. So we strongly appreciate this effort. And we know that there is a lot of uh, work that goes in the background. And I just want to say that it does not go un unappreciated. We really strongly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's humbling to follow Dr. Lafont. And I must say, it will never, I don't think it will ever feel natural to stick the carotid artery. But like you said, I think we just need to overgrow that fear and particularly once we have more data. Uh, the case that I'm presenting today is for a very pleasant 87-year-old female who uh, has uh, obesity with a BMI of 42. She's known to have symptomatic severe AS, 
and she had three uh, heart failure hospitalization. She underwent balloon angioplasty of the aortic valve. Um, I think she presented with the cardiogenic shock and they used it as a bridge and then she might have lost to follow up. Uh, this was done in a different institution. Uh, however, this was done 12 months ago. And she reported that she felt dramatically better for the next three months after the balloon angioplasty. Uh, she has significantly limited mobility, mainly because of her weight and coupled with the severe AS. Her resting ACG showed the right bundle branch block. I'm not gonna show her uh, CT scans, but her iliacs and femorals were great. And she was uh, smack in the middle for a 29 uh, millimeter band. Uh, this is our uh, usual tab we set up. So we have a single femoral axis for the confida wire. We cross with an, AL, with an AL catheter and then we exchange over a pigtail to a stiff confida wire. Uh, we have a pigtail coming from the right radial artery and we have a temporary pacemaker coming from the right internal jugular. Uh, we use this as it allows us to uh, ambulate the patient within six hours from the procedure and dis discharge them the next day. Uh, also using radial for the non-femoral or for the non-tabby access site uh, lowered our femoral uh, complication rate. Uh, you can see here that the leaflets are heavily calcified uh, and we can see uh, we're almost pacifying the, we're almost fully pacifying the uh, left uh, cusp as well. We've uh, positioned our uh, valve and we were thinking that it was a little bit high on this end, but we figured we'll start deploying and then as it dives deep, uh, it will probably be uh, at an appropriate level. So this is the valve partially open prior to deployment. And you can see that uh, from this side, it's about two to three millimeter deep. And from this side, it's about five or six millimeter deep. However, given everything, we were pleased with this and we decided to uh, let it go or fully deploy it. Uh, you can also see that the leaflets are not fully split or uh, to be more accurate, the calcium in the leaflets uh, is not cracked. So the valve is not yet fully, uh, fully deployed. Uh, we released the valve and you can clearly see that the valve is constrained by the leaflet. And we thought here, just looking at this, that the radial force exerted by the valve was not enough to crack the calcium or not enough to split the leaflets. Um, definitely went up a bit from this side, but not by much. And it was still below the annulus at this point. Uh, we, based on this, we had a discussion, should we uh, do balloon and should we post dilate this with a balloon or should we do a balloon valvuloplasty or not? And we thought, yes, we would. As we were preparing for the balloon, uh, we stepped on fluoro and we noticed that the valve has migrated up. This is without balloon valvuloplasty. Uh, however, even with this, there were no hemodynamic changes. Uh, we called for an echo and we took a couple of uh, aortographies uh, or aortograms with uh, different projections. Mind you, here uh, there were just a few PVCs from the wire and the LV, but hemodynamically, the patient was doing very, very well. This was done under conscious sedation. She was responding to commands. Her blood pressure was excellent. And the aortic waveform was uh, great. Uh, you can see here, there's non-significant PBL on this side, but not much. We allow, allow me, Saleh, for less than uh, uh, 30 seconds from each panelist and Dr. Lavon, what is, what is the uh, best option at this stage? If that's okay with you, Saleh? Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Lavon, just a small answer. What is the best uh, uh, approach on this? What do you do? We cannot hear you. Just unmute the... Uh, I would say the first emergency is to verify that uh, there is no occlusion of the coronary ostia. Uh, 
this is very important uh, because uh, obviously the valve uh, popped, popped up and uh, what I think uh, uh, happened, I don't know if you see my hands, uh, but uh, which was, we call it the palmito uh, syndrome, which means that in fact, this is uh, uh, the, the, the valve has not clearly well uh, deployed and uh, it was not uh, the fault of the practitioners, but then finally it deployed, but without control and it popped up uh, to, towards the ascending outer. So I would first check in emergency the coronary ostia. And if the coronary ostia are fine, then I would uh, uh, put another valve uh, without uh, trying to, uh, to, to take out the, the valve. But then if the coronary ostia are endangered, uh, occluded, then I would in emergency uh, sneer the the, the valve uh, to to the to the upper part of the ascending outer. Okay, great. Dr. Weil, do you do anything different? Well, uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, I agree with Dr. Lavon. It was uh, you know like constrained, and one of the image during the deployment there was clearly parallax. Compare the one while you deploy and this, there is definitely parallax. I think you were higher than you expected. The other thing is our scenario. Depend on the left uh, main and the RCA on the CT, if it's there low, definitely I will scenario. In general, I will scenario. Okay. Dr. Provide Sen? you do radial and femoral axis. Dr. Sen? Yeah, I agree. I think once a valve uh, migrated anti-grade, which is into the aorta, first of all, you have to scenario it because now you are forced to uh, deploy another valve and deploying both valves will really decrease the flow to the sinuses and the coronaries. I think the best actions and the recommendations is first to snare the valve to a safe area away from the coronaries, especially the skirt of the valve itself, and then deploy uh, another valve. If it's uh, migrated down to the LD or retrograde, then I think surgery is the best option if you can't snare it. Dr. Fahad? So the voice for had the, uh, just. I keep forgetting this, sorry if I was. Uh, I, I think given that patient is hemodynamically stable and we can see in the aortogram, the flow to the coronaries are good. Uh, I think we have, and the wire is still there. So that's very important that we don't lose the wire. So I think we'll try to snare it first. Okay. And then we deploy another one. So, good. So Saleh, back to you. Sure. Uh, I think that was our immediate reaction. Uh, first of all, as soon as we saw this, the level of adrenaline in the room was through the roof for everyone. The immediate reaction was open a second valve and you could see everyone in the room running for a second valve. And we were almost ready to open a second valve. However, we really thought, you know, she has a good pressure. She, you know, we're, the imaging we're not happy with. The valve is clearly not anchored by the annulus, but rather is tethered by the uh, actual aortic leaflets. So we thought, let's get a transthoracic echo uh, and observe her and wait. Uh, the second valve was uh, being prepped. So we got a transthoracic echo. It's stopped playing for some reason. Uh, this is the transthoracic echo uh, intraoperatively in the uh, in the hybrid lab, and you can see a, a shadow of the aortic valve here, uh, but it's only anchored again by the leaflet. You don't see anything in the uh, LVOT. Here is a uh, second view, and you can see not there is no significant PVL. Uh, the aort the the gradients were in the single digits, and the, you, you cannot see, you cannot appreciate any uh, valve in the LVOT. Um, this took us about 20 minutes, and you know, after assessing the patient for 20 minutes, we called our surgeon who was not scrubbed in the procedure. We had a, about 30 minutes discussion about what to do with this valve. And given how frail she was, we thought we'd actually stop the procedure. Uh, 
we thought we don't want to subject her to uh, sneering, manipulation in the aorta. But we were very concerned, and this was not a this was not an easy decision. It was certainly a split decision, and I think the surgeons, you know, I I, I remember the surgeons, wife, which was saying, don't treat the X-ray, treat the patient. The hemodynamics are great, the echo looks great. There is no PVL, so let's leave the valve alone. We usually discharge the patient the next day. However, given everything that it was going on, we decided to keep the patient for uh, four or five days in the hospital. Um, she also uh, was going to benefit from some rehabilitation, so we figured we would do that while she's in the hospital. This is her echo the next day. And again, no significant PVL. Uh, the valves look like it's in, in a stable position, and the gradients are in the uh, single digit. Here in the short axis, you can appreciate very mild or trivial uh, PVL, but nothing significant. Post op day three, the patient developed acute chest pain and an ECG that looks ischemic, looks like left main ECG. And we were really concerned that we embolized something to the, um, to the left main or she, she thrombosed her left main or that the valve has moved. She was taken urgently to the cath lab. And you can see clearly from, the, from her aortogram that there is marked PBL and the valve has definitely migrated up. Uh, so this prompted us to do what the panelists recommended and snare the valve. Uh, we, were, we looked at this image uh, a lot. So we were confident that we can deploy the valve without a pigtail. So we only use the single axis here, uh, radial to snare the valve and a second valve uh, through the uh, the old valve was snared, the new valve was placed in and then uh, dilated to just make sure that we're splitting those leaflets and uh, we had a good final results. She uh, came to her six months clinic visit and she was doing very well. Excellent. And you deployed a bit lower this time, right? Uh, yes, we didn't want to put a third valve. That would not look very good. Uh, definitely, definitely we wanted this valve to be a bit deeper. Interestingly, she had a baseline right under the branch block, yet she did not need a pacemaker, uh, which is a bit surprising. The case would, they would use a, that she would be quite a pacemaker. Um, I think Dr. Kreiser uh, joined us, so we'll, we'll go back to our uh, uh, panelists to comment on the, on the final uh, approach to Dr. Sal and his case. So, Dr. Lafon, what do you think? No, I think it's a case which has been well managed, and uh, congratulations to to the team. Um, I just uh, asked myself uh, regarding because we didn't see this free, uh, you know, this this uh, free cusp at the very beginning to be sure that the we were not uh, a little trumped uh, by fooled by by the image. Uh, and then for the position of the valve, it is absolutely critical to, to, to be sure that uh, there is no parallax, as it was said before. And uh, my second question was, uh, did you use exactly the same size of valve? Because uh, sometimes also uh, it can happen when the valve is, uh, the, the size is be a little uh, underestimated. So we used the same size. Um... And uh, I would uh, love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, the CT was very clear. It was, not, it was not a borderline case. The CT was clear in the middle for 29 valve. Okay. What are your thoughts? Would you have used a bigger or a smaller valve? Or would you have adjusted? Uh, it's difficult. It's always very difficult to, 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 <laughs> to comment. I would say that the, uh, what I would have done is uh, definitely to... I, I've, there is nothing to say, but it is true that in our experience, when the valve is moving, uh, even uh, if there, it looks uh, fine, uh, you, sh you should maybe consider that the, the second uh, valve should be put in the same session. Uh, okay. Thanks, Dr. Uh, not, it can Thank always you. move. And uh, there yeah. is no more calcification to, to stabilize the valve. Excellent. Uh, our panelists, if, if anyone has a comment, or otherwise we'll go to the next uh, yeah. presentation. Yes. 
I, I think you know, I, I, sorry, I have a call for me. The same? Yeah, you know the valves usually are anchored by the annulus. So, Saleh, what's no, the valve? Dr. Sen, comment please. Yeah. Valves are usually anchored by the annulus itself, not by the sinotubular junction or the aorta. And once the valve migrated uh, integrally, it has to be snared and it has another valve has to be uh, deployed in the same uh, session. Because definitely uh, it will not function normally and most likely it will migrate more until it finds a stable uh, position. I, I agree that the valve uh, should be deployed in the same session. Early in the TAVI experience, you know, in the 2010 to 2012, migration was up to 7% uh, or even higher. Uh, and one risk factor was previous uh, valve uh, intervention. I, know, I noticed one thing during this case that the valve was uh, not aligned to the outer curvature. It was in the middle, which really uh, put tension or applied tension on the valve itself during deployment and may, it may migrate up. So we have to make sure that the valve is well aligned to the outer curvature of the valve with no parallax and it has to be relaxed. Uh, thank you. Good. Wael so, Ashkari? Just, just quick comment. First of all, I would uh, advise anybody when they snare, they snare from both sides, otherwise they will injure the aorta, and we did it once. So you have to snare from both sides, advisable femoral and radial. My other comment to Saleh, what do you think was the mechanism for the embolization? Is it high, high implantation or it is calcified annulus? If calcified annulus, uh, then you have, in my opinion, to pre-dilate before you put the other valve, so to prevent the, the same mistake rather than you go deep. So that's my comment. Great. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to say, uh, we really discussed the mechanism at length. And uh, I, I think our conclusion is what Dr. Lafont said. It's that watermelon seed effect where the valve is just squished at the bottom and it, that allowed it to, uh, to jump. I think the deployment was, if anything, deep, but I think it was squeezed and the leaflets did not split and that's why it, was, it migrated the there was no resistance, Dr. Wael. Yes, I agree with the snaring with two snares, but there was no resistance uh, with one snare. So we figured it was with an implantation was in the other direction. Excellent. Dr. Basley, without comment or all yeah. of those other questions? Yeah. Uh, I think a great case, great management, Saleh. But I would like to emphasize on, uh, I wouldn't leave uh, uh, the valve like this and sleep on it. Uh, I would treat it in the same session. I'll put the second valve First of all, snare it and put the uh, uh, second valve in the same session because I, I wouldn't sleep on this uh, and leave it for the chance what will happen. I mean, the management is very clear. You need a second valve and uh, uh, I agree with the management. Also, I would like to mention about the pre-dilatation. This is very heavily calcified. So I think pre-dilatation is a must here. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, uh, Dr. Basleb, and thank you for uh, Dr. Saleh Aslaf. It's a great case, and we'll continue talking about it at the end of uh, our presentation here. Dr. Kraser, are, are you ready and with us? Do you hear me? Yes, we do. We cannot okay. see you. All right, so uh, can I, uh, you share yes. my screen? Yes? We only see the ceilings. Yeah. <laughs> the ceiling. I think this is one of the slides. Well, the problem is that uh, I have access on my iPhone, but uh, the computer is not transmitting the image. Reem, are we able to, to share the slides of Dr. Kreser? I think he, he, he has to share it with, uh, from his uh, laptop. Can you press it? Dr. Kreiser, can you join from the laptop? This is, uh, this is the desktop. I can see you well, but I have no control 
So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll leave you with the with dream to fix this technical issue, Dr. Preset, and we'll go back to our uh, panelist. Dr. Wael, uh, I have been recently post a lot of cases with the uh, cusp overlap. Uh, so can you just uh, talk about it? In the so so the uh, very important, because we are talking about moderate risk and low risk patient, is when you do the implantation, you make sure that you don't cause a left bundle branch block or heart block. And you want to make sure that you give the patient, again, the best chance of coronary access in the future. And the two only, or the three only best mechanisms so far here for preventing heart block or left bundle branch block is to do the uh, uh, high implantation with cusp overlap, either uh, right uh, ario codal and you do the, uh, what we call right cusp overlap, or you go extreme LAO and you do the uh, left uh, cusp overlap. Uh, in this, by this mechanism, uh, it's, it's too long to explain it here, but in this mechanism, you will end up by implanting the valve very high and very low risk uh, of, uh, according to the data available and from our experience, um, it's, uh, it will be a single digit uh, uh, rate of heart block. Uh, regarding the commissural alignment is, uh, again, uh, it's to make sure that your uh, valve uh, aligned with the commissure, the, the native commissure, so you can uh, easily access uh, the coronary. And the best experience in the bu best published paper is about 60 to 70 percent reaccessing the left main. Uh, the broad technique is, is when you st start to release uh, at the mid level of the, uh, the tip of the big tail. Uh, and uh, then after that, you advance a little bit and continue opening. Uh, this is a prevent manipulation uh, of the valve uh, a lot uh, at the level of the AV node. One last comment is measuring the septal membrane. As we know, about five to seven millimeter. Uh, if you implant like more than that, uh, if you have uh, a, a length more than that, it is good outcome. Shorter than that, you have high risk of heart block. Thank you. Excellent. Good. Dr. Hussain Al-Amri, uh, valve on valve, what do you want to say about it? From your experience. That is a delicious topic for Hussein. He just published a paper on that. I know that. <laughs> you know, valve on valve is really uh, uh, challenging. And I think if, if you think of it as the best treatment for patients with degenerated bioprosthesis, uh, usually we prefer core valve because of sobra annular uh, leaflets and function. It gives less gradient uh, and easier uh, deployment than uh, the Sabian valve. Uh, we, are, we have experience in, in these patients in micro tricuspid and uh, also in uh, uh, aortic position. Uh, in mitral and tricuspid, we use usually transeptal, no uh, anesthesia, no general anesthesia, and uh, uh, we use a Sabian valve. And for uh, aortic, usually we use the core valve. Uh, I think it's much easier to deploy uh, such valves that, uh, than in, in native uh, uh, aortic valve stenosis because of the clear anatomy, you have landmarks to use and also it's easier to anchor the valve in the uh, cage of the old or the previous valve. The challenge here is to make sure that the valve leaflet does not obstruct the left main, especially most of the surgical valves are implanted a little bit high. So you have small sinuses and the leaflet could uh, easily uh, obstruct uh, the uh, left main. Uh, so we usually depend on the CT scan to see the distance between the valve or the sinus and, and the left main. If it's less than eight millimeters, usually we don't do it. Uh, we prefer to send patients back to surgery. But if it's more than that, uh, we go for uh, valve uh, uh, and valve. The chimney uh, really procedure, I think it's too, it's too complicated, it's too much. Uh, and personally, I don't like to use it in, in, in these patients, even if the lift main uh, is low lying. Thank you. Dr. Hussain, just because before we leave this uh, topic, do, do you think that the guideline should uh, 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 revisit the issue of mechanical valve now with, with the possibility of valve and valve and TAVI? Uh, do you think that we, we should, uh, should change our practice, our surgeon practice, 
to uh, to tissue valve and if the patient need anything in the future we'll be happy in one minute because the slide of dr crasser uh, is ready i think yes guidelines should revisit uh, the uh, indications for mechanical valves uh, i think mechanical valve itself is a disease warfarin is another disease when a patient gets a tissue valve he lives a normal valve a normal uh, life as if there's nothing while with mechanical, you are replacing a disease with another disease with so many restrictions on his life uh, style. So, uh, you know, the guidelines are usually five, probably at least five years uh, delayed compared to the uh, evidence-based medicine. So I'm, I'm sure in the near future, most valves will be tissue valves. And uh, if it degenerates, uh, valve and valve will be the solution and it will be class one indication probably in the next five years. So we'll, we'll take this answer from you as a guideline. Do you send your patient uh, uh, who need a valve to, for a mechanical valve or no? No, I usually okay. recommend, uh, unless the patient is less than 40 years of age and he accepts the risk of anticoagulation and uh, he, I mean, he, he insists to get a mechanical valve. I always insist to get a tissue valve unless the patient is very young. Tissue valve means normal life to me and very low risk. I've seen a lot of patients with intracranial hemorrhage and, uh, you know, death, uh, decapacitating uh, CVA because of anticoagulation in mechanical valve. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Kreiser, uh, Reem, are we yes. ready? Yes. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can, uh, we can see the slides very well. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. It's a special pleasure to be part of this very important and interesting uh, webinar. Uh, I'm sorry for all the technical difficulties. I'm not exactly sure why my desktop failed me, but uh, I'm now using uh, my iPhone. So the topic of my presentation is predictions and the management of conduction disturbances uh, post uh, TAVI. Uh, next slide, please. I have no disclosures related to this presentation. Now, what's very important when we look at uh, historically from all the publications related to uh, TAVI with different type of devices that at 30 day permanent pacemaker amputation rates vary tremendously uh, for all uh, tower valves. It, they vary from uh, the incidence of 4% in the literature all the way to 37%. And we can see depending on the type of the valve such as uh, balloon expandable versus self-expandable valve, there is also significant uh, difference. So uh, obviously this is an we issue. We do not see the slides. You don't, you don't see the Thanks. slide? No, we do, we do now. Okay, so uh, uh, again, uh, if I would like mention this again, there's a tremendous difference as far as the incidence is concerned of uh, the need for a pacemaker 30 days, depending on the type of the valve and depending on the publication between different authors. And it ranges from 4% uh, to uh, 37%. It's the lowest with balloon expandable valves and the highest with self expandable valves, as we can see here for Lotus. Next one, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. All right, so uh, when we look at the conduction disturbances post-taver and the need for permanent pacemaker, uh, obviously that decision to implant a pacemaker or not to implant the pacemaker depends on multiple factors. Next, I'm sorry, I cannot move the slide, so somebody needs to move it for me. Next, please. So uh, obviously it depends on the type and degree of conduction disturbances, what is the first degree AV block, second degree AV block, or third degree AV block that will make our decision what to do. Next, please. Next, please. Next, please. Just keep clicking, please. Okay, there are also uh, baseline comorbidities that play a significant role. Of course, patients that are critically ill and have serious comorbid conditions uh, might prompt this uh, implantation to be done sooner rather than later. Next one, please. Next. 
Next, please. Just click, click on the arrow forward, forward arrow, please. All right. I'm sorry for this difficulty, but. Uh, I think there is a lack between the slides that we see and the slides that you see. Uh, because what we see now is a cusp overlap technique. Is that what you see? Okay, so let's go back to this, please, if you don't mind. Just go back, back to this. I'm sorry for this inconvenience. Back, 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 back. More, 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 more. Keep going back, keep going back all the way to that uh, schematic drawing. Keep going back, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Next, keep going. Back, 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 please. Back, please, back, back, back. All the way towards the beginning. Keep going. Okay, all right, uh, right. So uh, all those things play a significant role, whether we are choosing a post uh, a tabber pathway for early discharge, which is obviously our goal. It also depends on socioeconomic uh, factors. Uh, the cost of the valve is uh, sometimes in certain areas prohibitively high, and that also plays a significant role. And that is also very important for patients that uh, do not have option for extending cardiac monitoring, particularly for patients that live in very remote areas. So all of those things uh, play a significant role. Next slide, please. We can we see the the, can clinical, you see the, cl the clinical impact on mortality of permanent pacemaker implantation. Mortality related to permanent pacemaker implantation, we can see that uh, it varies to a certain degree, but in most of the publications, we follow not uh, necessarily any evidence and uh, mortality related to the patient condition, except for one study that includes a large number of patients, and you can see the great majority of patients receive the balloon expandable valves. So there are obviously multiple studies. Uh, that did not show a significant impact. However, this becomes very important for younger patients as we move to a lower risk patient that needs TABR. And what might happen after a longer time of uh, follow-up, this might become an important aspect. Next one, please. Now, uh, when we look at the permanent pacemaker implantation and the instance of left branch block at 30 days, and also uh, the need for permanent pacemaker, again, there are significant variations and differences between the valves. We look at the low risk trial for Evolute valve. As far as left bundle branch block, there was no significant difference between TAVR and SABR, which is interesting. However, uh, at 30 day pacemaker, the rate was significantly higher for TAVR than for SAVR. Now, when we look at the partner three trial, which was again, low risk with Sapien three valve, we can see that there is a significant difference as far as instance of left bundle branch block is concerned in 30 days. It was significantly higher for TAVR than it was for SAVR. But there was no dramatic difference as far as need for a pacemaker between the two groups at 30 day of follow up with Sapien 3. And we can see those differences clearly. Now, what is also very interesting and surprising as far as permanent pacemaker implantation is concerned in Evolute uh, low risk trial is that uh, there was a, a tremendous variation between the uh, center to center, operator to operator as far as need for a permanent pacemaker. And we see one operator and one center had a dramatically lower need and incidence of permanent pacemaker implantation than the others. And uh, we will discuss this a little bit more in detail because they used a different protocol 
and different criteria how to uh, implant the evolute type of valves. Now, another very important aspect that's extremely uh, important is what happens to those patients that have a pacemaker implanted uh, uh, at the time or shortly after the procedure prior to their discharge. And we can see here that not all patients require a pacemaker after 30 days. As a matter of fact, approximately 33% of patients with core valve prosthesis and a little bit higher number, 47% with lotus valves, were dependent on their pacemaker at a 30 day of follow up in this reprise three uh, study, which is interesting as well. So, next slide, please. Next slide. Next, next slide. Okay, so when we look at the risk factor for permanent pacemaker implantation, we know from multiple studies that one of the highest predictors is the pre-existing right bundle branch block. Uh, now, there are other factors that play a significant role as far as electrophysiological risk factors are such as baseline incidence of atrial fibrillation, prolonged PR interval, and also prolonged uh, QRS. Also, another very important factor that plays a significant role, and this is shown here schematically, is uh, calcification uh, in the landing zone that can contribute significantly to TAVR-induced uh, cardiac disturbances. Now, uh, what's also important that uh, uh, for uh, sapien three valves, it was a uh, higher volume of calcium that was a good and reliable predictor for incidence of left bundle branch block and the need for permanent pacemaker implantation. But for accurate neo valves, it was calcium distribution pattern that played a significant role for incidence of a need for permanent pacemaker implantation. So that has been experience of uh, most of us. Uh, in Tavar world that calcium certainly plays a significant role. Next one, please. Next slide. So another factor that is extremely important and that was discovered relatively recently within the last few years, that one of the predictors for need for permanent face implementation was uh, the implant depth. The deeper the implant, the higher the incidence of a heart block. And uh, that is clearly shown in this uh, particular slide. So when you go below the annular plane, the further you go, the higher the incidence and need for permanent basement implantation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So the investigators, uh, Jihali Yavi, and the colleagues uh, from NYU uh, Langona Health Center examined the use of minimizing depth according to the membrane septum size or length, so-called MIDAS approach with Evolute R and Evolute Pro valve to determine if that plays a significant role in uh, causing uh, the need for permanent pacemaker implantation. It is clearly known that self-expanding tower traditionally carries a higher risk for permanent uh, pacemaker implantation. And what they have shown and in their results that uh, by using this MIDAS technique, the permanent pacemaker implantation rate in their experience dropped from 9.7% to a 3%. And also the incidence of a new left bundle branch block dropped from 25.8% to 9%. When they looked at the univariate and multivariate um, analysis data, they showed that right bundle branch block uh, very short to length, less than this. 
particularly when it's less than three millimeters. And also larger valves like Evoluta XL, which is 34 millimeter valve, as well that more than what is the length of the membranous uh, septum. So those are very, very meaningful, important variables. Next slide, please. Next one, please. So uh, how to uh, achieve this goal? And the several authors have clearly the cusp overlap technique and cusp overlap view is very useful in isolating the non-coronary cusp from the overlapping the right coronary cusp and left coronary cusp. So now you are only looking at two cusps. And this is generally uh, best done in aerial imaging plane, as we can see here in this uh, presentation. This view therefore provides a good anatomical reference for deployment depth uh, at this point of, like, of the non-coronary cusp because it elevates the outflow tract in long axis view and reduces or removes the parallax uh, at the marker band and also assists in, with depth visualization near the non-right commissure and membrane septum during the deployment. But what is very important that you will need a good quality CT obtained with contrast that is free from movement artifacts and uh, splice misregistration. So, next one, please. So when we look at the technique of cusp overlap view, here we see first uh, three cusps that are not obviously lined up and that causes a miscalculation as far as the depth of deployment. But in the middle image, we can see that now we are achieving a, a left and right coronary cusp overlap. And that is in this particular scenario achieved in RAO, not in LAO. And then by performing a slow deployment started at a supra annular level, will allow us uh, for the valve to descend to its target position with minimal catheter manipulation. And we can see here with minimal movement. And then we can see um, the final result. Next one, please. With perfect placement to about a millimeter to uh, two millimeters below the origin or the image of the non coronary cusp. Next one, please. The final image. Next, and, uh, and what this will actually allow us, uh, this technique will minimize the risk of interaction with the conduction system and therefore the need for a permanent pacemaker implantation. Next one, please. Next slide. So in summary, as far as predictors and management of conduction disturbances post tabber it is clearly shown from the literature that right one branch block uh, at baseline is the, one of the strongest risk factor for permanent pacemaker implantation for stabber, but also atrial fibrillation, prolonged QRS interval, and also landing zone calcification have been shown to play a significant role as well. The new onset branch uh, has been associated with higher mortality in certain studies and reduced left ventricular ejection fraction recovery after TAVR. The permanent pacemaker mutation rates vary between institutions and also operators and their experience and also publications for all valve types, but particularly for certain self-expanding valves. Now, it has been shown as we have seen publications and simple modifications to the procedural technique and the implant depth, uh, depth uh, target may help reduce the risk of permanent pacemaker mutations post tower. However, I think that more research is need needed to identify patients who may not be dependent on a new pacemaker after discharge. And also, as we have seen in uh, this challenging case presentation that we just 
shown before my presentation, it is still a challenge in certain scenarios, even for the most experienced operators to accurately deploy the valve and avoid migration like it occurred in that challenging case presentation. So obviously there are certain needs for deployment design that will be more user friendly and safer to avoid those sometimes catastrophic complications. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kreiser. Uh, if there are any questions or discussion, uh, hopefully we have a few minutes left. Great. Uh, I really appreciate your effort. You did it very well, although they have a, a technical difficulty as someone changing your slides. You manage it nicely and uh, you cover all that uh, topic uh, a great way. I think we're reaching the uh, conclusion of, of uh, our webinar. We'll allow our panelists and speaker to uh, uh, say the final comments about uh, the two presentations uh, and our case presentation that done by Dr. Sal. So Dr. Fahad Basli. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great two talks, uh, very comprehensive and uh, covering all aspects of TAVI and especially uh, electrical uh, disturbances. Uh, challenging case that we have seen. Uh, we have seen how it was managed in an excellent way. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, Dr. Hussain, do you have any comments? Uh, outstanding presentations. I really enjoyed uh, every bit of it and every slide. Uh, we always learn and we will always learn. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Wael Kashkari. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Krajeser. It's a, a wonderful talk. You summarize all the important hot topic uh, that each implanter uh, should adopt. Again, I will name it, cusp overlap, commissioner alignment, measuring the septum and the broad technique. I think uh, for the uh, old implanter like myself and the new implanter, you should come out from the box and you should adopt this technique for better uh, uh, conduction outcome and better hemodynamic outcome. One last comment, if you have a heavily calcified lesion and you are adopting this heavily calcified valve and you are trying to do these techniques, which is you know, high implantation technique, my uh, personal view is uh, to pre-dilate. And our experience is about 4.5% rate of base maker with this technique. Thank you very much, everyone. Great, thank you. Dr. Salah um, thanks a lot for the great presentations and thank you so much for the feedback and the comments in my case. I certainly learned a lot from the case and learned a lot from the panelists. Great. Antonio Lavo. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chris, uh, because uh, you manage very well despite uh, technical problems that can happen. Um, what is your algorithm of, uh, in terms of uh, occurrence of uh, LBB? Uh, because uh, I heard that uh, our colleague uh, was uh, leaving the patient one day after. So, which means how do we manage when the occurrence of LBB, you, do you, what is the, the answer to, to the indication of pacemaker? Do you have a uh, special guidelines or? So, Dr. Kreiser, uh, uh, answer this question and find a then we'll freeze we'll or do you see the stabilization? Right, uh, so uh, uh, I, I all uh, like to make sure that our patient leaves the hospital safe without uh, significant risk of heart block in asystole. So we are probably a little bit over aggressive from that point of view, as we have seen from previous publications, as far as need for a pacemaker implantation. And typically, typically we, um, if we have complete heart block in the cath lab, then we uh, typically implant the pacemaker right away. Uh, that, that, that has been our uh, general approach. If we have a lesser degree of a heart block, whether it's a, a second degree in Mobitz 1 or Mobitz 2, we tend to observe them uh, for at least 24 hours and then make a decision. That has been, that has been our approach uh, in general. Uh, but uh, 
I, I think that uh, there is a possibility that a significant number of patients will recover their conduction uh, disturbance if we monitor them for a longer period of time. As a matter of fact, in the core valve original trials, we were obligated to keep the patient in the hospital for five days because of the potential risk uh, of a heart block. And that obviously delayed patient discharge. Most of our patients are now discharged uh, 24 hours uh, after the procedure. Uh, in the great majority of patients, uh, we, uh, we can achieve that without any significant risk. And that's why we are more aggressive in the uh, but with a new technique, overlap technique, it's uh, dramatically lower and probably pretty close now to the balloon expandable valves. I don't know whether this is your approach and uh, your algorithm that you use at your institution. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kreiser. Uh, you did a great job. Thank you very much for all. Uh, it was a great uh, webinar. We cover a lot of topic in TAVI. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, questions have been raised with the presentation and the case presentation. I appreciate uh, uh, all our speakers. Uh, they, you did very well in covering topics. Thank you very much for our panelists. Thank you very much for Dr. Saleh to present the case. We are continuing uh, with the GIS master course. Uh, stay tuned with us. Also, we will are working aggressively to make our uh, next uh, GIS uh, conference in Dubai the first week of November happen. Uh, so uh, we wish to see you all uh, at that time in Dubai under the umbrella of GIS. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.